Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the freedom we have in these United States to come to you, Lord, that we don't have to hide like in other nations, God. We pray for those other nations, Lord, that you would bless them, Lord, and that you would show them favor. God, we just pray for your anointing today during this, this class, Lord, our study of your word, Lord. Speak through Anne with your anointing, your words, your tongue, Lord, and that everyone here today will leave with a new feeling of the authority that we have over Satan, God, in this world, that we can count on you, that you've given us that authority, Lord, and that we can walk boldly before, Lord, and just bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lynn, for that beautiful prayer. You know, I was just thinking how many nations have large churches growing like crazy in Iran and in China and other places, but they still have to hide. They still have to, they're still underground, they say. And we are still a nation that can worship God. So even though we, we don't like a lot of the pressure and a lot of things that are happening now, we still can say, thank you, Lord, that we can openly praise and worship. Yes, yes. All right. You know, concerning authority overall, I just want to explain this to you. Sometimes you may not feel like that you have much authority. When you start praying for people, just take your authority anyway and express it. And sometimes you feel like that you were a failure, nothing happened. But I'm telling you, in a case of emergency, it can come forth whenever you don't even realize it. I was praying one time for my granddaughter. Well, I just heard some bad news. My granddaughter, this was many years ago. She's already, I think, in her 40s, and she was just a teenager still at this time. But she had been in the hospital, and she had a very serious back problem, and it was caused from some kind of, I'm not really sure what it was caused from. It was in the bone, it was in the bone anyway. And the doctors had said that she might not ever be able to really walk normally again. She had to be in bed for like nine months with a brace on. And um, she could take it off only to take a shower and had to put it right back on again. But anyway, um, whenever she told me this news, what had happened to her and everything, I was telling my husband about it. And while I was telling him about it, he said, he, oh, it was, um, see, I'll I'll think what I'll the name of it was. It was something that is very, very hard to cure. Osteomyelitis. Osteomyelitis. <laughs> something like that. It was a, it was a disease, disease in the bone. It causes sometimes when there's a, a wound or a break in the bone. His sister, when she was 10 years old, broke her, her leg when she fell, and she fought that disease all of her life, and uh, penicillin and everything else. Nothing would really keep it. Would might keep it in, uh, under control for a little short while, but not entirely. And it always kept flaring back, and she still had it with her from the day she died when she was 85 years old. Yeah. So praise God, he can heal though. But that's where our authority comes in. We have to know who we are. Yes. And whenever I was telling Bob about this, he said she'll fight it all of her life, just like my sister Mary. And I said, no. And all of a sudden, I mean, I began to explode in prayer. It scared me. <laughs> he must have thought I was mad at him maybe or something. I don't know. But do you know what? When I called her, she said that she felt like she was completely healed. And, and whenever the doctor finally took that, uh, uh, did another MRI and had her come in, already had a surgeon standing by to operate on her back. And as soon as he looked at the x-ray, he called, told his nurse, call and cancel that surgery. Her back was 100% old. <laughs> That's how authority will take over in your life. Whenever you really need something, it'll be there. And that's what you do. You may not even realize when it's going to happen. But all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit knows that this is exactly what you need. Then you need to know and put it into practice. Start using it anyway. Take your authority over Satan. Take your authority over adverse situations and adverse problems. Yes. I had a friend. Uh, her name was Lois, and her husband was a preacher. And she had an 11 inch rod in her spine. And I just kept praying for her, praying for her. And she came over one day and she said, The Lord told me I needed to come over here. Do you know why? And I said, Yes, I have to lay hands on you. And I took my oil and I poured it down her back and went right down her spine. And she thought, Oh, oh love like that. And uh, wow. she could never move, bend, turn like this, nothing. And we went to the doctor three days later, and there was no rod in her spine. Wow. I mean, she went wow. all over with her husband. We was telling everybody, God removed the rod you know, out of 
really great miracles happen yes. spontaneously at times. And it's when people are praying that know who they are. When that Holy Spirit hits them, then all of that authority yes. and all that other stuff comes out that you need at that moment. And I remember uh, a time when we were praying in a woman's house, just a small group of us were praying. And we were praying for healing for one another. Well, this one woman said, you know, I have a really bad tooth in my mouth. I'm going to have to go to the dentist. But it's a, a situation that's going to be very difficult to work with. And I really need a new tooth there. And this woman, that uh, she had a Catholic background. Don't tell me Catholics don't know God. They do. She prayed for that woman, and you know what? A whole brand new gold tooth just suddenly <laughs> appeared in her mouth. God does do miracles still today. We just have to we have to take authority over the unbelief, and authority over Satan, and authority over uh, any obstacle, and just absolutely pray things into existence, and it will happen. Let's see. Where was we last week? We were talking about David and how that David. Uh, he did not want to take any shortcuts to the throne. He wanted only when God put him on the throne, when it was God's time. He had every opportunity in the world to uh, kill Saul, to take him out completely so that he would be the next king. But do you ever think about the fact that if he had been king right away, we might not have all these precious psalms that we have today? Because a lot of those psalms were written whenever he was feeling kind of downcast sometimes and how he was depending and relying on, on God. And they are such a comfort to us today yes. that we have these. God has a plan beyond what we understand sometimes. We just have no idea what the future is and sometimes when things don't happen immediately just remember that meanwhile God still is working. God is still working in the lives of somebody that he has a reason for delaying his time. So if something is right, there is no need to fight. If something is right, you don't have to fight. Just let it go. Let God take care of it. We're to let the Lord judge sometimes. And that's what David did. David knew he had every right to do a way with Saul because Saul was trying to kill him. And it was like almost like a self-defense thing. But he said, no, it was the Lord's anointed and God has not withdrawn him yet from that position. So he was now honoring the position of Saul, not his character, but his position. And because he had been God's chosen person at that time, he was still honoring that. So even when we're right, God has a greater work. A lot of times God has a greater work. We submit to him and not try to solve it ourselves anyway just because the opportunity arises. We don't, we can wait upon God. And you have to let your conscience be your guide. Yes. And hopefully you have a good conscience. Yes. Because what is the conscience? It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit talking to you, that's your conscience. And so that spirit of conviction that says just hold off, don't do anything right now. I had an experience like that just this last week. To keep my mouth shut, I wanted to say something so bad I couldn't hardly stand it. <laughs> And I said, I just felt like I needed to keep my mouth shut and let God take care of it. And he took care of it better than I could. Better than I could. And everybody, everybody was a winner. Everybody was a winner. When God does something, he knows how to do it to make everybody at peace with one another at the same time. So um, in a church, a believer may rebel against the pastor's vision. However, he still is the delegated authority in the church. And, and then they sow discord, they call each other, and they say, you know, I don't like this, what the pastor did or said or something. And first thing you know, you got that person disgruntled also. First thing you know, the church splits and half go here and half stay. And it just really becomes a mess. Don't let that ever happen. Don't let you, you ever be the subject of that. Yeah. Somebody that would do something like that. Yeah. Uh, and, and I've seen that before, talking about talking about things when you shouldn't be continuing to talk about it, you should be praying about it instead. So a church uh, usually ends up in rebellion. The people end up in rebellion. And if it's a vote situation, they all pass, uh, vote them out. But in, in some cases, if the church was founded by the pastor and by the Lord calling him to that, and they put up their own money to build that church, you're not going to vote him out. It's his church. 
It's God's church, but it's him, him that built it. And you're not, there's nobody else to vote him out or to put anybody else in. But some of these organized churches, that's just the way they are. They don't like the pastor or something, and they get a little group together, and first thing you know, they want to call for a vote. They vote him out, and the, and the uh, main office, wherever it is, or whatever, sends another pastor there. That should not be. That should not be. Whenever God puts somebody in a place, we should honor that position. <coughs> So anyway, and David was convicted just because he smote a little piece off of his robe. Uh, but that was just to let him know later that he could have struck him, but he didn't. That he honored him. And he, was that something important? Lynn? No, just okay. in case you needed a tissue. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. If I need one, I'll pick it up. I'll <laughs> anyway, uh, he honored God in that situation, and we need to learn to honor him too when things like that arise. So say David reverenced God even though he was in that Saul was in the wrong. He still reverenced God. He let God take care of the matter. So many times if you let God take care of the matter, he will take care of it far better than you could. Amen. I have discovered that in my own life. And I'm just learning. You know, we keep learning day by day how, how to do things. But I was absolutely in the right, and I could have spoke up and said something to this person. And I was going to do it in a very polite way. However, God didn't want it said at all. <laughs> he wanted to take care of it his way. So uh, by the, by, uh, to be an authority, we must have the utmost respect for those in authority. We have to have good respect for those in authority. And also, if you think somebody's in the wrong, you know, even if it's your pastor or if it's somebody that's above you, you still have the right to go and go to them pleasantly yeah. and humbly and ask them, did you do this or did you do that? I heard somebody say something about that. And if they say no, then you have to honor their word. Yes. Even if they're lying, you still have to honor their word because they are the authority. And how can you know if they're lying or not? Right. If there's no eyewitnesses to a matter, don't even, don't even carry it anywhere. Don't even carry it out of the building if there's no lying witness because people can dream up all kinds of things. Suspicion can be aroused in all kinds of ways and all kinds of matters. So we need to just go to God with things and let him take care of the matter. So those whom God has chosen will be removed by God if they get out of line. Remember that. They will be removed by God if they get out of line. So the believer is subject to the anointing on a ministry. Authority is in the call and choice of God. Once you've agreed that someone has been called to their place of leadership, then don't be quick or hasty to rebel or leave when you think that they are doing something wrong. Don't be hasty and let God take care of the matter. God would rather save that person than have a split in a church. He would rather take care of that matter. He's the one that can bring conviction. The only person I know of that used to have this gift that actually he saw but see visions of people doing things, a lot of this times it was because of those things that hindered them from getting their healing. And that was um, Kenneth Hagin Sr. Uh, a lot of times he, he said that one time this one person came up for prayer and he he just, no matter what happened, it seemed like that he wouldn't be healed. And Kenneth Hagin had the gift of healing, and he knew that when his hand got hot and prayed for somebody, they were almost always healed. But this man, no matter what, could not receive his healing. And he saw a vision of him, and in this vision, he was lying on a couch out on a, like a front porch or something, and he was, he was praying and feeling very convicted over the fact that he hadn't been tithing. Now, this might seem like a small thing, but it can hinder your healing if you are convicted. Anything that brings conviction, it could be anything. It could be what a very small thing. It could be conviction because you had an argument or a fight with your spouse or with somebody in your family even. It could be conviction over anything. And so when he saw that, he knew that that was what was keeping him from getting his healing. And he personally went to that man privately and he talked to him and he said, you want to get your healing? Start paying your tithes. <laughs> and that man, I says, I've already, God has already spoke to me about it. And, he says, ben, and he was healed. So, you know, sometimes just a little thing in our life that can prevent us from getting healing, our healing or getting um, 
free from some problem or something can be some little kind of a hindrance. So if there's any guilt at all, any guilt in us, get it under the blood. Get it under the blood. And when I say that, begin to plead the blood of Jesus over it and say, God, just touch me and heal me in this. There was a problem in my life one time that I just could not get it out of my head. And I just was praying about it and praying about it. And, you know, finally... That spirit of conviction came so strongly, I just broke down and started sobbing and crying and sobbing and crying until I thought I could never quit. When I was done, it was gone. When I done, it was all gone. It was all gone. You know, sometimes, you know, and I'm not, and I don't cry very easily. That's what's so ironic about this. I don't get, there's a few things that touch me whenever something happens, a really extreme kind of situation, especially helping somebody that's extremely poor. Or I heard a man in our church one time talking about in Mexico how many of these children that were digging out of dumpsters just trying to find something to eat. It was a terrible situation there. He had been a lawyer. He was a very wealthy man and everything. But God kept putting, putting conviction in his heart to help take care of these people. And there's one man kept calling him all the time and said, Mr., you're the one God's calling. You're God's calling you. And he said he felt it himself, but he didn't want to do it because it was just... It was not what he felt like he wanted to do. But finally, when he gave in to that, then he now calls himself the prince for the prince of the poor. And he goes around and he helps these kids. And he gathers them up in groups that he helps them to get a better life and to help, uh, help strengthen them and grow them up into good adults. And so he just really, and whenever I heard that story, my heart just broke inside and I just began crying. I thought I could never quit. But over my daughter's death, over Barbara, I could hardly cry. You know what? It's just, I don't know what it is that sometimes the things that you would think that you would cry about, you can't cry at all. And other times when you think it's a really good story, you should be rejoicing that I cried. So who knows? It's a strange situation. Okay. Jesus is our perfect example of submission to authority. He, is submiss he was submissive to the Father. He said everything that he did, he only did what the Father directed him to do. Some people say, you know, remember when Peter and John went to the gate beautiful after they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they raised that man up, healed him? Jesus walked into that temple many times in his lifetime, but he never healed that man. The Father hadn't directed him to because he wanted to save that for Peter and John. You know, there's a lot of times you wonder why does a person do something about a certain situation when they possibly could. It might be because God has not directed them to do so, that he is saving that for another situation. So don't even condemn people whenever they don't do something when you think they should have. Maybe you should have been the one doing it. Yeah. Who knows? So anyway, uh, Jesus took on the form as a bondservant, and he only did what the Father told him to do. He only did what he saw the Father do. If he saw the Father do it, he did it. And why Why did he wait so long before he went to the gate, uh, the gate there where the people were trying to get into the water to be healed? And that one man that was sitting there kept waiting for somebody to put him in the water and he could never get there in time because he was crippled. Jesus must have walked by him a hundred times throughout his life. And then finally, one day though, he walked up to him and said, do you want to be healed? And of course, we know the rest of the story he was. Mm -hmm. So, praise God. We need to learn to kind of do that too. Don't just jump the gun and think you're the one appointed to do everything that you see. God might, maybe has appointed someone else to do it. So, he was a voluntary slave. Think of yourself as a slave and a servant to God. Yeah. That you are his voluntary slave. God, use me wherever you will. Show me when I should open my mouth and when I should shut it. All right, Philippians 2, 7, and 8. It says, instead, this is talking about Jesus, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God, and he died a criminal's death on a cross. That took a lot of humility. And not, not only that, in those days, it was, when you say he humbled himself, and, he, and uh, all, of his, all of the shame and everything else that went with it. When you're on the cross there, you have nothing on. All the pictures that you ever see show some kind of a loin cloth around him or something. He had nothing on. 
that is extreme. That is extreme shame, and that's what they did to criminals. So he they, he took the full punishment of everything that that mankind did to someone else, and he was allowed himself to be hung there, totally naked in front of the world, and in great pain and severe pain for our sakes, for the joy that was set before him. You know, that is what is so astounding, that he did not consider it a terrible thing. He considered it a joy to be able, that the Father chose him to be able to pay for the sins of the whole world. That's what he did. It was such a joy to him that he could do this to see somebody saved. How many times have you done something really hard just to see somebody else have a better life? We don't do that very often. I admit, I don't think I go out of my way when I'm really in severe pain. Somebody did call me one time when I really did not want to go, that they were dying, and they wanted me to come by and see them, and they were at home, and I did go. I'm so glad I did because she didn't last very long after that. But you know, sometimes it's not physically comfortable to get up and to do something when you feel like you need to do it. But God will give you the grace to do it if you're doing it for His sake. Yes. He will. So then also that we have in the following, Luke 22, 24 to 27. Then they began to argue among themselves about who would be the greatest among them. And Jesus told them, In this world the kings and great men lord it over their people, yet they are called friends of the people. But among you it will be different. We're supposed to be different than that. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank, and the leader should be like a servant. Yes. When you are a leader somewhere, nobody should be able to hardly tell you the difference amongst everybody else. You should be working right along with the troops, right along with them doing whatever that you're supposed to do. You don't just sit back and order other people to do everything. So who is more important than the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? The one who sits at the table, of course, but not here, not here. He was telling the servants, not here in this world, not here. That's not what his servants should do. For I am among you as one who serves. So now let's look at the following scripture as an example. If I can turn this page, I need a page turner. <laughs> Sorry. I have trouble for some reason separating my pages. Okay. All right, in John 13, 4 through 17. So he got up from the table, and he took off. Now, he had just said these things to him. He got up from the table, took off his cup row, wrapped the towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he had around him. It was customary in those days that when you went to somebody's house or you went to dinner or somewhere, that there was a servant there that would do this. Well, there was no, none in this particular place because this was a place where they were having the Last Supper. And so there wasn't any servant there hired to do this. Jesus himself knew ahead of time what he was going to do. So when Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never, ever wash my feet. And Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Yeah. Now there was a spiritual meaning behind that. Yes. We, know we always have to be washed by Jesus, Jesus uh, with his word. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands, my head, well, Lord, and not just my feet. And Jesus replied, a person who has bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. In those days, they wore sandals all the time. They didn't wear socks and shoes like we do. And everything, everywhere you went was just dust and dirt. And so a person's feet would always be dirty whenever you got somewhere. Then you disciples are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew who would betray him. And that is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again, and he sat down and he asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that's what I am. And since your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. Now that doesn't necessarily mean literally, we don't live in the same circumstances they did then, but that means that we are servants with, of each other, that each one of us needs to consider ourselves a servant of the other person, to do what we can. 
I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. So now that we know these things, when somebody calls on us to do something and it's not convenient for us to do, what do you think? We ought to try to do it anyway. It's not always easy. It isn't always easy being a servant, but think of those people that are actual servants in this world, of people that dominate them, that are cruel to them, and if they don't, they get beaten with so many lashes or something like that. They don't even care if they die from the beating. Yes, Lynn? I was going to say, and this came up in, in my life recently, sometimes it would be very painful and will hurt you to do what God wants you to do. Yes. But you have to swallow your pride yes. and That's just, right. you know, yeah. obey. Right. Yeah. And no matter how much it hurts. Because yes. uh, he knows what's right. Yes. That's right. That's right. Now, God does not call us to be, what should a word should I use here, martyrs, martyrs. doing things that for others, uh, expecting to get some reward for it when it isn't really done in a, with the, by the heart of a servant. Um, there's a difference. There's a difference. You may not I want to do it. I mean. uh, <laughs> so you may not want to do it, but you, yeah. you have to. Okay, in Matthew 20, 25 to 28, it says, But Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those who, that are under them. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you, you must be he, you must be your servant. You must be a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to serve, but to serve others, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Yes. He came for that purpose. Did you raise your hand back there? Yeah, we, we didn't hear your the address. Speak up loud if you can. We didn't hear the address. What's the scripture? scripture? Oh, it was Matthew 20, 25 to 28. Thank you. The Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all equal in power. They're equal in power. They have different functions, basic function, functions. But they're all equal in power. But they also serve one another. Yes. In other words, the Father just has to... You know, the Father is the thinker. I think I've said this to many of you before. But do you know thoughts come into your head and because of your thoughts, your mouth speaks? Yeah. And because that your mouth speaks, then something that needs to be done, then, then your spirit causes you to do it. So it's just like, uh, it is with the, the Father, the, the Spirit, and the, and the Word. When the Father thinks that the Word speaks it and the Holy Spirit carries it out. Yeah. We should be that same way. When our thought, a good thought comes to us, not an evil thought, but when a good thought comes to us, then our mouth should speak it out and we should get busy and do it. Yes. Praise the Lord. So the Godhead, the Father, the Son, are equal in power and different in person. One of Jesus' purpose for coming in the flesh was to demonstrate perfect submission. God the Father equals authority. I just looked over here and noticed it. Dear friend, Cherie, you know what? Whenever it's kind of dim like this, I don't see really, really good. I'm, I'm amazed at Pastor Randy. He knows where everybody is and everybody better be in their place. <laughs> and he reaches out there to call on you and you're not there. <laughs> He'll call your name anyway. So God the Son Jesus equals obedience. Now let me say that again because I interrupted with my little <laughs> comment there. God the Father equals all authority. All authority. Jesus the Son equals obedience. When we're obedient to authority, we get blessed. So when Christ and his uh, church, so when Christ and his church, Christ equals authority and his church equals obedience. When we are obedient, then we have that same authority that Jesus has. When we walk in obedience, that's not always easy to walk in complete obedience. But walk in the obedience that you know to do. He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is sin. That's a very simple verse. Praise God. But we need, And sometimes it's hard for us to do what we know to do that is good, but we don't do it, and God forgive us. So with all delegated authority, it works 
the same way. All delegated authority is like the person above you has that authority and you are submissive to that authority. Keys for submission to be filled, first of all, before I get into this next, I want to say to be filled with Jesus is to be filled with obedience. Yes. The more that you love him, the more you will obey him. He said, then even the scripture says to those that have forgiven much, love much. How many of you were forgiven much? Yes. Boy, I know I was. Yeah. You know, we don't have to have to got out and kill somebody or done something real radical. Just the fact that we were born in sin is much yes. because we're subject to all kinds of things that will happen in our lives that can happen. But Jesus saved me from all those things. He saved me from so much sin that I could have committed in my lifetime. There's so many times that I don't even know that even how he even, how I even survived it miraculously, things that happened to me that I should have been killed, and I wasn't. But God preserved me, and preserved me for what? I don't know, but he preserved me. <laughs> but anyway, thank God. Thank God that he did. Thank God that he did. You know, whenever you accept him as your Savior, you are more likely to live a long life than people that will not because there's a lot of people that die young and a lot of times it's because they did something very stupid. Well, I did think stupid in my life. <laughs> but I knew who God was even, I, I had been taught about God, let me put it like that. I'd been taught much about God from the time I was a child. But I didn't really know him personally until I was about 19 years old. I mean, that time that that time whenever I was sitting there in the pew and they had been preaching uh, and calling people to come forward that wanted to get saved and I said oh I'm already good, I'm okay I haven't done anything wrong lately you know, I felt like it was alright and all of a sudden I saw Jesus standing behind me and he was looking at me and it was very sad and I knew, I just knew all the sins just came before my eyes things that I had done in my life lying, hating whatever, doing little things. I was not, I was basically a good kid. I was basically what you would call a teacher's, uh, teacher would say is a good student. I, I respected my parents, I respected my teachers, I did what they told me to do. I was basically what you call a good student. But I was not saved. And all of this sin in my life was not forgiven. And whenever he did that, I just all of a sudden, I started exploding and crying. <laughs> I never went to the altar, but I think they all knew. <laughs> I couldn't quit crying. I cried so hard and so long, thought I would never stop. But it's like those tears, I always feel like those tears, when you cry like that, they're washing it all out. You're just washing out all those sins. It's those tears that keep washing them out. So sometimes we just need to have a good cry. Get ourselves back in order again. <laughs> So in Philippians 2, um, we have to empty ourselves and make of ourselves of no reputation. You know what that means? Yeah. We're nobodies. Yeah. We're nobodies. Yeah. Just keep that in your head, that you're a nobody. Yeah. And then you just have to empty yourself and let God use you. Yes. And whatever he does with you, it's not because of anything that you are. It's because of his Holy Spirit and his power in you that yes. causes you to be good. Because only God is good. Only God is good. None of us are good. We're all, even at our best, we are not good vessels. We are just, we need to empty ourselves to be good. We need to get rid of everything inside of us to be good. And let God use us for his glory. Philippians 2, 7 says, Instead he gave up his divine privilege. He took the humble position of a slave and he was born as a human being when it appeared in human form. He had great wealth in heaven. He had everybody. The angels praised him and worshipped him. He was God. And the hair, all of a sudden, he just came down here to earth to be a man, just like any of the rest of us. The only difference was he never sinned. He was not born under the same race as Adam. That's why it had to be somebody different than from Adam's race. Nobody from Adam's race could ever pay the price for anybody else. They had to be somebody special. So, but, but he looked just like a man. He had to suffer like a man. He had to do things like a man. He got hungry like a man. He got thirsty like a man. And, and probably his feet hurt when he walked 100 miles. You know, just little things like that. He had to live as a man. And he knows, and that's one reason that he can be a good advocate for us and pray for us because he knows the hardships and the problems that we go through. And because of that, 
He now prays and intercedes for us continually. Can you imagine that? Yes. He is praying for you continually. Yes. He wants us to be strong. He wants us to do all the things that he's called us to do. And we've got to listen to him and do those things. So he emptied himself. He emptied himself of his divine glory. And he came down to be a servant like us. So who are we not to empty ourselves and to be like him? In Philippians 2, 7b says, When Jesus took on servanthood, no one made Jesus a servant. He chose to serve. He chose it. He chose to be a servant. There's many people that would want to get away, that even run away from their cruel masters and everything. And then even there's a scripture in the Bible that says even you're supposed to obey those that have power over you, that have the authority over you, even if they are cruel. Yes. Even if they are not really nice all the time. You still are supposed to respect them as the person over you. Mm -hmm. Philippians 2.8 says he humbled himself in obedience to God and he died a criminal's death on a cross. Humility, humble yourself, this is something hard for a lot of people to do. Even the most, the most wealthy person in the world, why do we like movies that show people that are very rich and really famous and great and awesome that do some hum humble thing to help somebody else? They touch our heart, don't they? Yes. And that's what God is asking us to do. He wants our hearts to, to be so humble and considering ourselves a nobody because God loves to take nobodies and use them. Wow, he can do great things if you think you're a nobody because then he can, has access to you. Then he has access to you because you have laid down your own will. You've crucified that will, and you're willing to let the Holy Spirit just take access. Praise God. So in the second part of Philippians 2, 8, it says he humbled himself in obedience, in obedience to God, and he died a criminal death. And we just talked about how horrible that kind of death was. It was a very hard, shameful, humili humiliating death on, the top, on top of all the severe pain that he went through. They said his body was so racked with pain and it was distorted to the point where he didn't even look like a man. Can you even just imagine how horrible that had to be? So obedience is the one thing to say we are, that we are we, submission, but we are, man, what am I reading here? <laughs> but we are submission to the point of death. How many of you have ever been under submission to the point of death? I have not been. And I don't think many of us have been because God doesn't expect it. He did it for us. He doesn't expect us to suffer like he suffered because he suffered for us. Because he did not want us to have to suffer. That's why we don't have to go to that terrible pit, that terrible place where he never wanted any man to have to go. And many people have gone there. I thought about the people in the flood, the time of the flood before Noah, that were wiped off the face of the earth. Every one of those people went there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Every one of those people went there because yes. not one of them was righteous. God only found one righteous person in the world at that time, and it was Noah. Think about that. How ter terrible that is. Hell has got to be full. It's got to be full. But, but you know what? I think it expands just like heaven expands. When we go to heaven, and, and nothing is ever crowded. There's so much you can't even walk across heaven in a day, even with our superpowers when we get there. <laughs> you can't walk across heaven in a day. They said it's a, it's a circle just like the earth is. Well, he made the earth kind of similar to what, uh, what heaven is like. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a huge, huge, huge big circle, but it's probably 20 times bigger than the, the earth. And when the earth is created new, it becomes a new earth again and new heaven because everything here is going to burn up. So anything here that you think is a very, very uh, godly or, or anything that is you, you just can't part with it let's put it like that something that is so great you can't part with it think about that everything on this earth except our bodies and hopefully everybody here is going to be off of this earth at that time it is going to be totally totally destroyed completely burnt up and totally destroyed but he's going to remake it and when he does it will be ten times larger than it is now because there's going to be more people from beginning of Adam to all now that they're going to be living on this earth. Think about that. Wow, and it's going to be like heaven. It's going to be heaven. He's going to bring heaven down. And, and we're just going to have heaven here on earth. So only it won't be this earth. It'll be a recreated. It'll be a restored, remade, I might say, whatever. 
So anyway, everything on this earth is going to be destroyed with all of the great castles and all of the great uh, places and things that are so beautiful and everything is so wonderful. It is nothing compared to heaven. None of them are anything compared to heaven. And they're all going to just be destroyed. So, so don't let your don't let yourselves get tied to anything to think it's so precious you can't part with it. Yeah. All right, that's part of emptying ourselves. So, in the second part of First Corinthians, we just read that. Okay, it's all the obedience that I want to stress here that he humbled himself in obedience to God. Obedience is the one thing that say that we are in, they have to be in submission to. If when we are in submission to obedience, then we are in submission to God. And sometimes we just think of that. He only calls us to one thing, and that's to obey him and to love him. To love him with all of our heart, our mind, and our soul, and to love one another. Yes. Think about that, how important he considers one of, every one of us, that he would ask us to love one another as much as we would love ourselves. And he puts it in the same category, the same sentence almost, that he does when he says we're to love the Lord God with all of our heart, and our mind, and our soul. Yes. Then we're to love one another also as ourselves. Yes. Um, great authority can only be given to those who have an understanding of submission and servanthood. Great authority can only be given to those that have a good understanding of servanthood and of obedience. Yes, we are. There are three truths in fulfilling our part in the kingdom of God. Number one is who are born again are under authority with Jesus as king. We have to be firstly under authority of Jesus before we can be under authority of anybody else or even have any authority. We have to first, Jesus has to be the primary one in our life, nobody else. And number two, some are appointed and anointed by God to lead and to feed. Not everybody is appointed by God to lead and feed. Did you know that? Some of us are called to follow. Yes. Some of us have to follow because he, he uses us both in his own kind of way. We don't know how God wants to use us, and we have to be in submission to that. Some are called to follow and do the work of the ministry. You still can follow, and you can still do the work of the ministry. There's a lot of things in the ministry that has to be done. You know, for, for anything to work well, you know, for anything that you see that works well, you even see a movie or something. There's so many people in the background that help make that look like it does. So many people in the background that helps helps with all the props, with everything else to do that. You know, there was a, uh, when we were in school, there was a book we had called, it was Ministry of Helps. It was talking about Ministry of Helps. But it also applies here to this lesson. And this name was Buddy Belt. And he said that he had been in this, started in this church when he was a young man. Uh, and when he was about 17 years old, they put him in charge of the youth group. And he was doing a great job with them. He had built it up and it was really growing and everything. And he wanted to start having some satellite services in different people's homes. And whenever he did, and he was already planning this. He was making big plans for it. He had everything lined out and everything. And when he submitted it to the pastor, the pastor said, no, my brother, you didn't do that now. And he was really upset over it because he thought it was a really good decision on his part and he was very upset that the pastor would not agree with him. But then he began to pray about it and whenever he prayed about it, the Lord really blessed him beyond his imagination to the point where he was willing to submit to anything. And he submitted to this pastor and this pastor was a, a, was a traveling pastor and a lot of them in those days were. He went to other churches and other places and this man became his right-hand man. And for 30 years, he worked with him. He helped set up his meetings and set up things for him and do all of these for him, things for him, even humbling himself to the point of figure that he was never going to have his own ministry. But after 30 years, God gave him all, his own ministry. He began traveling all over. He even went to other countries and places that this pastor had never even gone to, preaching the word of God. And he became a servant. So sometimes servanthood, God lifts us up whenever he sees a good heart. When he sees somebody that's willing to help somebody else to be who they are, God will raise you up and give you your own also, whatever it is that you help serve in. So God sees all of these things. Just like I used to always tell my kids, there's nothing you can do that God doesn't see. There's nothing you can think that God doesn't know. He knows every one of our thoughts all the time, and he also is thinking of us continually, all the time. Every one of us. That's 
That's because he's God. We can't understand it. We can't understand it because it's so, so great and awesome. But he's thinking of you right now, and he's thinking of you and praying for you and thinking of the good things he can do for you. And he wants to bless us. All good things come from God, only Amen. from God. So the authority of Jesus and how he got it. We're starting on a new section, and um, we're going to go back to probably a, a lot of his earlier life. In covering this because this is how he got his authority the authority of Jesus and how he got it Adam sin caused mankind to lose their authority God because of great mercy and grace could not leave us in sin God says we were his creation he did not want to leave us in this condition he didn't want to you know sometimes people say why didn't he just erase uh, Adam and Eve and start all over again well, the problem is that somewhere along the line, someone would have sinned anyway and done the same thing. Yeah. And because that's, that's what Satan's tactics were. He was going to destroy God's people and the God's creation. That's what his desire was. So God, because of great mercy and grace, he could not leave us in sin. He desired for us to have fellowship with him again. That's his greatest desire was that he would have children that he could enjoy and have fellowship with. Just like we as parents, sometimes whenever a child is born into our household, we love that child and we want to always see that he does well. And most all parents really have a heart for their children, want to see them do well in life. They, uh, it makes them sick whenever their child is sick and, and they want to do the very best they can for them to help them to grow up and be a good, healthy person. So God feels even more so than that than for that for us. He desired for us to have fellowship with him again. He desired for us to have authority in the world again and authority over Satan. That's the way he created Adam and Eve. He created them to have fellowship with him and he came to them every evening in the cool of the night and he had fellowship with him continually. Did you have a question? Okay. Praise God. Praise God. Okay. So he desired for us to have authority in the world again and authority over Satan. That was his desire from the beginning, and he hated it whenever he see, saw that. And what was it that caused uh, this to happen, the change? was because Adam sins. He sold us down the river, all of mankind right there. He sold us down the river. And he knew he was doing wrong because he knew what God had said, and he did it because his wife had done it. He agreed with her and just did it. He could have said, well, I'm really sorry. Sorry you did that, but I've got to obey God. You know what? God would have blessed him with like some somehow or other. He was not the only one that God could have blessed him with. There could have been another. But anyway, it doesn't matter. That's what happens. <laughs> and once something happens, it happens, and you cannot call it back. Back. And we need to remember that too. Once it happens, it happens. So God sent His Son Jesus to take back our authority from Satan. Romans 5 17 says, For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many, and even greater is God's wonderful grace. His gift of righteousness for all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death. We will live in triumph over sin and death because of His great gift. Through this one man, Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord forever. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. That was just as good as God himself coming to earth and saving us. Yes. But he had to do it. He had to do it in a, with a human. He had to do it by somebody that was a human because it was against his own law for an angelic being to come and interfere with our lives. It was against his law. That's why he couldn't even, he couldn't even just do away with Satan. You know, the spoken word, he could have done away with Satan by just a word and said, get out of here forever. And he would have been gone. He created them, he could decreate him, right? <laughs> All right, Jesus was born of a virgin by the Spirit of God. This fulfilled Genesis uh, 3.15. The seed of woman will bruise Satan's head. This is what he said to the uh, serpent, serpent. In Genesis 3.15, he says, And I will cause hostility between you and the woman, because your offspring and her offspring, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. And that's what serpents do, right? But he was talking about the one to come. The one to, that was going to come would totally destroy him. And then we see the birth of Jesus. This is the one, the promised one from it, the garden, from the garden when he promised this to Adam and Eve, that he was going to send somebody that would, would, that would help so that they would not have to die for all eternity. 
Gabriel came to Mary, a virgin, and stated uh, that she would conceive a child. Luke 1, 26-33. This is a very familiar scripture, but we're going to get into some detail here. In the ninth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. By the way, that was an important statement saying that she was a descendant of King David because Jesus had to come through a pure bloodline. You could track his bloodline all the way back to Adam. It had to be a pure line. That's why God destroyed so many people in Noah's day because Noah was the only one he found with a pure bloodline. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't you... Uh, don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor for David, or ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Jesus' kingdom will never, ever end. He is going to rule and reign forever and ever and ever. We might as well get used to it and be willing to reign with him, right? Hallelujah. Amen. So the child was to be named Jesus. He was to be called the Son of God and would be great. He would reign over the house of Dave, Jacob. There would be two, no end to his kingdom. Now Mary goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth in Luke 1, 34 through 41. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. And the angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Now she didn't say that's impossible, that can't happen. She said, How? How will this happen? Mm -hmm. So she was very open to hearing what he had to say. Very different than sometimes we are. Said, No, that can't even be God because that's impossible. You know what? God is a God of the impossible, right? <laughs> All right, the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative, uh, relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she's now in her sixth month. That was another impossible thing. Elizabeth couldn't have any children, just like Sarah couldn't have any children whenever Abraham in Abraham's day. But God is the God of the impossible. She is now in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And the angel left her. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, to the town uh, where Zechariah lived. She entered the Mount house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, in those days, only... Special people, special people were filled with the Holy Spirit. Today, the Holy Spirit is available to all of us. But in those days, all the kings and, and princes and uh, rulers and people like that were filled with the Holy Spirit and prophets. Mary was filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you think she was pretty special? She was in the same reign and rule with kings and princes and, and, and prophets of God. So Elizabeth had a revelation by the Holy Spirit, and that's what the Holy Spirit does. Gives us gifts right away. Gave her the gift of revelation. That the baby Mary carried was the Lord Jesus. Gave her this gift. And so when Jesus was born, angels appeared to shepherds and proclaimed to them Saint, a Savior had been born, which was Christ the Lord. Amen. I often wondered. Those, those uh, shepherds, they came into town and saw the baby, and they told everyone about it that they saw and knew. And not one of the high priests and the religious people of the day bothered to go and see who it was. Isn't that amazing? I mean, I think that I would be the first person, oh, man, I want to go see, I want to go see. No, not one of them did. Luke 2, 10 through 11. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord. They even told that it was going to be the Messiah. That was the one that was prophesied from so many years before. The Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. Do you think that the whole world would be rejoicing and going to see that? Jesus begins his ministry after his baptism with, uh, with John. That's when it began. Why? You'll find out. 
Matthew 3, 16 to 17. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling right on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly beloved Son who brings me great joy. He had to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit just like we do before we can begin a ministry. Because it's that baptism of the Holy Spirit that gives us the gifts and the ability to say the things that we say. You know, I sit up here sometimes and I say things that even amaze me. I think, God, what caused me to say that? The first time I ever spoke, whenever I was in on a Sunday night in the church, Pastor Randy asked me to, and I just, I felt so unqualified, and I felt, I was absolutely petrified. When I got up there, I was so scared, I was shaking, and I said, Lord, I just need some help here. And all of a sudden, the minute I opened my mouth, was, I just felt from the, my feet through the top of my head, a whoosh, Amen. like that. And later, I listened to that CD, and it didn't even, I didn't even know that was me. It sounded like a foreigner person I'd never heard before. I knew not one word that I said after that. See, God knows how to bring you into ministry. He knows how to take care of you. He'll give you the ability to do what he calls you to do. And you have to trust him. Sometimes it's hard to trust him. I'm telling you, that was hard for me to get up there that day. It was very hard. But God gave me the anointing that I needed. He gave me the assurance that I needed. And he filled my mouth. Because I didn't even know what I was saying most of the time that night. So here, uh, where am I? I'm Matthew 3, 16 to 17. That was after his baptism. I already read that. That was whenever he baptized him. And that was whenever he got his anointing to begin his ministry. i got about five minutes left. Okay, at age 30. He was 30 years old then. He was baptized. And the Spirit of God descended from heaven like a dove and landed on Jesus. Now why do you think he had to wait so long before that would happen? He had to keep learning. He was learning all that time. He was learning about who he was. He had been studying the scriptures. He could quote the scriptures better than when he was 12 years old, better than some of the men in, on the, in the Sanhedrin. Because he was standing there and they said that they were astonished, astonished at his questions and astonished at some of the things he said. That's because God had given him ability to understand because he had no sin in him. When you have no sin at all in your life and whenever you are walking close to God, he will anoint you to even be able to understand his word better. Yeah. Even whenever you sit down to read, ask God for your anointing over me while I read your word. Give me something special in this word today. A voice thundered from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That also gave him the encouragement to know that the father was ab absolutely with it, going to be with him always. So only after being baptized with the Holy Spirit did Jesus fully operate in his authority. And we are the same way. We really need the baptism of the Holy Spirit throughout the church today, throughout all of his church. He gave it so that we would be able to be strong and be able to be faithful and do the things he's called us to do. He doesn't expect us to do it within the flesh and with our own strength. We have to have that baptism. Luke 24, 49 says, And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. They weren't ready to go out and minister until they received the Holy Spirit in power. These are the last words that Jesus spoke before he ascended on high. And you know, out of 120 people that were standing with him at that time, only, what, only 10 people or so went in and was filled with the Holy Spirit that day. And so God doesn't, he, he gives the gift to all of us, but we don't all receive it. We don't, uh, we don't take, a, take it serious enough. We can't, we can't make ourselves receive it. It comes from God. And the reason, the way that we receive it, in case some of you really want to know, is through worship. Amen. Most everybody I've ever seen that has received the baptism of the Holy Spirit was worshiping God, and myself included. When I came out and I knew that I needed to get up and go pray, I was just praising God and thanking Him for the service, the glorious service we'd had, and, and for the next day. And I was just so anxious to go back to church again to see Him move in the Spirit and do something great and wonderful. And I was just praising Him and thanking Him for everything. And all of a sudden, I heard somebody talking in some strange language. And I said, what in the world is that? And then it took me a while to realize it was me. <laughs> 
will come upon you through worship. Through worship. <laughs> All right, the temptation of Jesus. In Luke 4, 1 through 2, it says, When Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River, he was led by the Spirit. I almost had it. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now we're going to talk about his experience and what happened there. Okay, by now he had the power of God in him and he was strongly anointed. This is right after the anointing. That's when you're at your strongest too. That's why we need refillings. We have to keep, keep getting filled over and over and over. All right, but this is where he was tempted by the devil for, 30, for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing all the time and became very hungry. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness where he stayed for 40 days with nothing to eat. There was nothing around him. There was no Kmarts. There was no 7-Elevens or anything he could go to. He was out in a place where there was absolutely nothing. There was probably not even any trees with berries or anything else on them. So Satan tempted Jesus while he was at the, his weakest, and that's the way he does with us too. When we're at our weakest, that's what he's going to come and tempt us. I think it's time. Uh, so anyway, the, what, what was his first temptation? We'll do that and then we'll have to quit. And we'll care, pick this up next week. He tempted him first with, why don't you make these stones? If you're the son of God, why don't you turn these stones into bread? And he had the power to do that. He could have spoke those stones into bread. But he knew that that was not what he was supposed to do because God hadn't told him. The Father hadn't told him to. If the Father had told him to do it, then he would have done it. But remember, he only did what the Father told him. Only what the Father told him. And so he said, it is written, thou shalt not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Father of God. So we have to learn to live that way too. Learn to live. And now we have his written word today, which makes it a lot easier for us. Read the Bible every day. Try to get out of it as much as you can. Ask God to reveal to you what his word is saying to you for that day. And pray for his grace over your life for every day in your life. Every day. Because we need his grace. We don't know what the devil has planned for us that day. Read the word of God and thank God for it. Okay, that's all we're going to have to be of time to do today. We'll catch us up right there next week. I'm going to mark it now with my pencil, which I haven't been doing in the past, and I finally got smart. <laughs> After how many years? <laughs> okay. All right, let's, let's stand and be dismissed, okay?